c'est dans... Okay, now. <coughs> okay, put it a little bit down. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, no. Let, let it go a little bit. Now next we are going to talk about how to engage in the practice of mind training by maintaining mindfulness and vigilance. So first is about uh, how to observe the morality of restraining the negative deeds. When we talk about morality, there are three types. First is restraining the negative deeds. Second, collecting the virtuous qualities. Third, helping sentient beings. So in Buddhism, when we say morality, it is not <coughs> practicing a discipline which is imposed upon you by some external force. You practice morality for your own benefit. So, morality, practice of morality means doing something that is good for you. So, the first thing that is good for you is stop doing negative things, restraining from negative deeds. Second is, restraining negative deeds is good, but that's not, not enough. So, the second is collecting or doing good things, collecting virtuous qualities. That is also good, but not enough. Why? Because the end purpose is helping sentient beings. So if you are helping sentient beings, you are practicing morality. If you are refraining from negative deeds, you are practicing morality. If you are collecting virtuous qualities, you are practicing morality. So that is the concept of morality. Okay. So now we first speak about the morality of restraining the negative or misconducts. So in this case, first you should make sure that you, your body, speech and mind are purified your body, speech, and mind are purified. So verse number 34. When just as I am about to act, I see that my mind is tainted with defilement. At such a time, I should remain unmovable like a piece of wood. That means in all times, in all places, you should maintain mindfulness and be vigilant. And the first thing that you need to do is what kind of conceptual thoughts are coming in your mind? When, I, when you see that my mind is tainted, meaning that you should examine what kind of thoughts are coming. And when you find that the mind is tainted and mind is with the defilement, then if you found that it is a non-virtuous a, a non thought, when you investigate and see whether it's a virtuous thought and non-virtuous thought, when you find it's a non-virtuous thought, then you realize that this non-virtuous thought will, thought will harm me in this life and harm me for many lives. This is uh, one with the defilement. So therefore, then physically you don't do anything. 
verbally you don't say anything and uh, also make sure that you my your mind does not chase the negative thinking therefore he's saying i should remain unmovable like a piece of wood okay next Never should I look around dis distractedly for no purpose. With a resolute mind, I should always keep my eyes cast downwards. That means in all times, in all situations, you should use your eye also for virtuous practices. And, and uh, don't, don't get distracted, don't keep on looking all around and don't let yourself distract it. So you should not look with a distracted eye and also do not practice hypocrisy in front of other people. You know, you pretend that you are a good practitioner and those of certain disciplines, that is not what we are suggesting. Uh, with a resolute mind. Resolute mind means a mind which should be primarily focused on emptiness, the truth. Don't get distracted, focus on the ultimate reality. And I should always keep my eyes cast downwards. Meaning that when you walk also, you should see, you know, whether you're trampling on insects or not whether the road is risky or not, slippery or not, <laughs> all these things. You know, if you're distracted, then you fall and break your leg. Right? So, so be mindful. Be mindful. So, so when you meditate also, you make sure your, mind, your eye is a little bit focused on the tip of nose. So similarly, when, when you move around also, your mind should be primarily focused on the reality, impossible emptiness. But that doesn't mean everywhere, everywhere you go, you should just be thinking about emptiness completely and moving, then again you will fall, you see. In, in Tibet, there, there, there are many stories of great meditators who, who are always thinking, you know, bodhicitta, they're thinking, they debate and then think. And it says that sometimes they, they debate and when the debate session is over, they come back to their home and then they take the key out and put the key in the hole of the lock and then thinking, you know, an hour or two just standing there. <laughs> Many stories like that. Sometimes they may be cooking something but thinking and then instead of putting the lid of the, the, the pot, they would throw the cup into it or something like that, you see. There are many cases of people falling down from cliff or something like that. So that that is not what we are recommending. You know, you should you should be you should be mindful of whatever you are doing. Okay, the larger focus is bodhicitta, emptiness, and so forth. But okay, <clears throat> so this is important. When when just as I'm about to act, I see that my mind is tainted negative thoughts are coming, then at such a time I should remain unmovable. Don't say anything. If you're about to say bad things, stop. Right? Nobody knows negative thought has come, but at least you don't, if you don't express it, okay? So don't verbally, physically express those negative thoughts and make sure that your mind does not chase that negative thought. Never should I look around distractly for no purpose with a resolute with a resolute mind. I should always keep my eyes cast downwards. If you keep on looking towards others without any reason, then you get into problem also sometimes. Why are you looking at me so intently? So, so they might, you know, pick up a fight with you. Okay.
This is so because if you keep on looking around, then you might see something which is object of attachment, which is an object of hatred, you see? So therefore, therefore, for serious practitioners, it is suggested that, that you should act as if you are, you should live as if you are blind. You should live as if you are a dumb. Because if you engage in too much talking, you know, sometimes unnecessarily it hurts some bad people, you see. And then you keep on looking as we already read. You know, you will see so many things. Oh, this person, my enemy, you get angry. Oh, this person, I like, you develop attachment, you see. Right? Right? Okay. Whenever there is attachment in my mind, and whenever there is the desire to be angry, I should not do anything or say anything, but remain like a piece of wood. Oh, is that one? We miss one, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We miss. In order to relax, but that, that does not mean, that does not mean, so, so first we said, you know, you look downcast with, with your eye downcast, don't get distracted, don't look all around. Having said this, this does not mean that you should not look around for your security. So the next verse, in order to relax the gaze, for a short while I should look around. And if someone appears in my field of vision, I should look at them and say, welcome, hello. For example, if you just keep on going like this, your, your eye might get tired. So might stretch your neck and look a little bit around. That is okay. And then when you look around, then when you see somebody, then welcome them, exchange pleasant words. And in fact, somewhere in this text, it says, whenever you see some, some sentient beings, you should, you should welcome them mentally, saying that it is in relation to these sentient beings that I'm going to get enlightened. So they are so precious, so important, you see, right? So when you're walking, when you're sitting, uh, if, you, if you're tired of just looking at one, you know, place only, then in order to make your mind rest, in, your, in order to make your eye rest, of course, again, with mindfulness and vigilance and without distraction, then you are allowed to look around. There also you need mindfulness, vigilance. And if somehow some people turned off in front of you, then uh, uh, you should welcome them, okay? So welcome or whatever, you know, according to the, the prevalent custom, you should uh, welcome that person. And similarly, to check if there is any danger on the path, I should look again and again in all directions. To rest, I should turn my head around and then look behind me. That means, for example, if you are traveling through a frightful road or path, where there is possibilities of your enemy or uh, other, you know, source of fears. So you should check whether these are, these source of fears are there or not. And while your mind is not being distracted, uh, you know, again and again, you should look towards all the directions, east, north, to west, for your safety, for your security. And then the, the way of looking is not like, like, not like this. Slowly, slowly, you know, you just, just see. What's happening? Is there anybody following me? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> oh. And especially when you are resting, uh, to rest, I should turn my head around and then look behind me. Okay. Okay. 
So it's saying that you should not just, when you, when you are resting also, then suddenly don't just jump and look around, you know. People might get frightened if you suddenly do things like that. So gradually turn around and, and look back, whether there's any enemy or wild you know, animals, things like that. Having examined both ahead and behind, I should proceed to either come or go. Being aware of the necessity for such mindful alertness, I should behave like this in all situations. So having looked before and behind, having examined whether there is any source of fear or not, then you should decide whether to move forward or backward. So similarly, you should maintain such kind of mindfulness, whether you're staying with somebody, moving in a city, moving in a town, or moving in the forest, or among a crowd, or whether you're eating or sleeping. So that's the meaning. I should behave like this in all situations. All situations means whether you're eating, sleeping, walking, in the city, in the town, in your house, among the crowd, okay? Being aware of the necessity for such mindfulness. That means see whether it is useful for you or others. A mental mindfulness. Once having prepared for an action with the thought, my body will remain in such a way, then periodically I should look to see how the body is being maintained. No meaning that, for example, in Tushita, or in a city, in a town, or in a house, if you are undertaking a meditation, undergoing a meditation session, then you should see the state of your body, meaning physically you should see it cross-legged and the mind also in a meditative equipoise, observing what we call as the seven or eight Varochana postures. You know the seven, eight Varochana postures because you have been doing this meditation for a long time, right? Like this, the tip of the, all this you know. And the two shoulders should be also of equal size. It is said that if your shoulder is on this side, there is a likelihood of inducing attachment. If shoulder is more on that side, there is a likelihood of producing hatred or anger. If it is too much backward, arrogance. Too much forward, ignorance. So therefore you should maintain that equilibrium of the body. Okay, so there, there are many things like that. So once having prepared for an action with the thought, that means that is the motivation. You develop this motivation, now I will undergo this meditative session. My body will remain in such a way, that is the eight or seven Verochana postures. Then periodically having prepared means right from the preparation until to the end, you should be able to observe that posture. Then periodically I should look to see how the body is being maintained. Whether you are able to observe that posture or not. That means you should maintain that vigilance. Vigilance must be there. With the utmost effort I should check to see that the crazed elephant of my mind is not wandering off but is bound to the greater great pillar of thinking about dharma. Just like when the, the mad elephant which you have bound, if it sometimes, if it goes, if it is released, then it can do great harm. So likewise, if your mind is controlled by attachment, anger, and so forth, and acts like a mad elephant, and then moves towards external objects of attachment, hatred, and so forth, and in this way it gets distracted, then, then this will bring the harm of being born in the lower realms. 
So therefore, make sure that your mind is not distracted, but focused on the Dharma. There's the meaning to the great pillar of thinking about Dharma. Dharma means listening, thinking, meditation. Okay? So there should be this one-pointed concentration. To the great pillar of thinking about Dharma. So, so in this way, just like the elephant tied to the pillar, your, your, your body should not move, your mind should not be talking, and sorry, the, 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 your, 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 you should not be engaging in you know, gossiping or things like that, and you, your mind should be thinking about the words and meanings, the views and meditations, and so forth. Okay? Those who strive by all means of, for concentration should not wander off even for a moment by thinking, how is my mind behaving? They should closely analyze their mind. Now this is for those people who want to undertake a profound meditation. If you are somebody, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm reading something else. Okay, these two, word, two, two verses already covered. Those who strive by all means of, for concentration should not wander off even for a moment by thinking, how is my mind behaving? They should closely analyze the mind. Okay. Now next, in the case of those serious practitioners on the profound meaning of meditative stabilization, however, if I'm unable to do this, when afraid or involved in celebration, then I should relax. Likewise, it has been taught that at times of giving, one may be neutral to certain aspects of moral discipline. Now that means, Okay. So, so you're you're encouraged to one pointedly focus on that object of meditation, and make sure that your mind doesn't wander off, which we read in verse number forty-one. However, verse number forty-two. However, if I, I'm, I'm unable to do, because you can't sit there meditating one pointedly all the time. Okay, and especially, however, if I'm unable to do this when afraid, that means, for example, there, if there is a threat of tigers and lions, there is a threat to li your life, or you may be, when afraid or involved in celebration, that means you may be observing a very important sacred day of the Buddha's birth or teaching and so forth, And then, especially when it is related to benefiting others, then you can relax a little bit. You can relax a little bit. Likewise, it has been taught that at times of giving, one may be neutral to certain aspects of the moral discipline. That means moral discipline, morality, practice of morality is very important, but it depends on the situation. For example, if your focus is more on giving, then at the, at the time you should, for the time being, no need to think about morality. You can't do all these things together. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Does that involve, for example, alcohol and psychotantric rituals? No. Some tantric, or at least some, some people say in the tantric. No, 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 no. No, don't don't try to take advantage, huh? <laughs> no, there's a big misconception, you know. It's all in just the Dalai Lama says. You know, some people say that when you do tantric practice, then you can drink wine, you can have sex, and you know, all those things, you know. And especially sexual union is important to get enlightened. That's totally on a higher, different stage. 
And then the, the criteria whether you can do that or not is there are some experiments you can do. If you are able to see urine and wine, same. Your, your state of mind is such that you don't see, make any difference between what is pure, what is impure, what is clean, what is unclean. Then you can use anything. But we'll not drink wine, drink, you drink urine. <laughs> Although some people say it's for some disease it is good. I mean that is different, you know. But generally, right? Right? So therefore, therefore, you know, when, when there is a the special offering, then they distribute a very small piece of meat and things like that. This is just symbolic. Symbolic. A little bit of wine like this. Symbolic. Yeah. So relax doesn't mean sing, dance, drink, wine. Da, 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 da. <laughs> likewise, it has been taught that at times of likewise it has been taught that at times of giving one may be neutral. Neutral means for the time being you can stop. You can't do everything. In in every situation in practice there are sometimes you, you, you can focus on this, sometimes you can focus on that. Like, for example, in the initial stage when you're doing meditation, if your meditation is only on compassion, you need to spend a lot of time. And if you do a little bit of meditation on compassion today, next day a little bit on bodhicitta, and next day a little bit on shunyata, I mean, nobody can say you can't do this. But if you're serious in achieving one thing, then you can't keep on moving like that. Right? So first make sure that you are able to achieve good success in this. Then the next stage, then the next stage. Right? And if you are able to achieve success in one topic like compassion, you have already, you've already done a lot. Then the other practices and the other meditations will also be much, much, much easier. Much easier. Okay. <clears throat> so relax means you can be more uh, <clears throat> whatever is convenient you should do it that is what he's saying I should undertake I should undertake whatever deed I have this is the point. I should undertake whatever deed I've intended to do, a thing of doing nothing other than it. This is I would call it specialization. You see? I would call it specialization. I should undertake whatever deed I have intended to and think of nothing other than that, at that particular moment. With my mind applied to that task, I should set about for the time being, for the time being, see? Not always. I should set about for the time, uh, for the time being to accomplish it. This not only in Buddhist practice, but in anything you do. If you are good in one thing, make sure you are good in one thing. Sometimes we become Jack of all, master of none. You know, you know a little bit, but there's no depth, you know. You know a little bit English. Can you, can you write a book? No, I, my English is not good. You're able to translate a little bit. Can you translate this one? No, I'm sorry, I can't. See, so, you know, you, you study computer a little bit, both, the, both the, the software and hardware, but then somebody's computer breaks. Can you repair it? No, I can't, you see. So there's the problem, both in you know religious practice, also mundane activities. You should really be good in one thing, okay? Now this reason is, the reason is, by acting in this way, all will be done well. But by acting otherwise, that means jumping from one subject to another subject, neither will be done. 
neither will be done. So therefore, in your life also, if you, you are asked to do a number of projects, my suggestion is don't accept all of this. You think carefully, even if there is a lure of money, think carefully. Right? So if you, you stick to one project, finish it nicely, that, that, that gives you extra strength to go for the next project. But if you start this project, unfinish this project, unfinish, you know, then people will chase you. And then this days you, you have a project, when you have a project, it means you should finish it before the deadline. So I, I don't, don't take any project, even if there's money and there is a deadline, if I think I will not be able to do it. There is a lure of money, I know that. But I, with the realization, if I try to follow the deadline, before the deadline, I will be a dead person. So I don't want to do that. Many a times, people said, can you translate this? I'll give this much money. Thank you so much. No, I want not money, I want freedom. You know? And when you're free, do something that you like, there's no risk of deadline, then it's very good. It takes a little bit more time, but you enjoy it doing good. Right now I'm translating two books whenever I have time. No money, nothing. I'm doing it just by, out of my choice. So the progress is very slow because I do many other things, but it is slowly, slowly coming up, you see. <laughs> things like that. So, so make sure. Likewise, there will be no increase in the proximate disturbing conceptions that come from a lack of alertness. So that means if you start one project and without finishing it, go to the next, you will not be able to achieve success in both of this. Which means basically you are not vigilant. Likewise, there will be no increase in the proximate. Uh, there, there will be no increase. Uh, what does that mean? Likewise, there will be no increase. Mm. Okay, okay. Likewise, there will be no increase in the proximate disturbing conception. <laughs> this is a little bit difficult to understand. So this means proximate disturbing conception means Leg of mindfulness. This is also kind of leg of vigilance. There's a kind of uh, proximate disturbing conception. So if you just focus on one thing, then there will be no increase in that leg of vigilance, right? And because that leg of vigilance or mindfulness come from a leg of alertness, okay? A very good example that's given here is if you try to lift one leg, um, without, without lifting one leg, if you try to lift both the legs together, you will fall. That's what he's saying. This, this is the example. Okay. Next is how to guard your precepts and without letting it decline. If I happen to be present while a senseless conversation is taking place, or if I happen to see some kind of spectacular show, I should abandon attachment towards it. Meaning that Sometimes, in order to please the mind of some people who are really sick and who are old, you organize some shows, some entertainments, and also make some jokes, and also engage in some gossiping. And you, you end up talking too many things. Or in other words, 
to help a beggar get his food or some money. You, you do a, you know, monkey, you know, uh, let a monkey play, you know, form some tricks and play some musical in instruments. So, so like that, there are many kind of spectacular shows. So this you are doing, you know, to, to help other people's mind because they are not well, they are sick. So you're trying to uplift the spirit of their mind. But in, in your case, <laughs> you should still maintain mindfulness, don't develop attachment. If, if I happen to be present while a senseless conversation is taking place for purposes, certain purposes, or if I happen to see some kind of spectacular show, I should abandon attachment towards it, okay? If for no reason I start digging the earth, picking at the grass of grass or drawing patterns on the ground, then by recalling the advice of the Buddhas, I should immediately stop out of fear. So in order to check yourself, not to engage in meaningless activities or careless, heedless activities, Especially it's important that you are in front of some, you know, lamas or great practitioners. You should live your life in such a way that, that, that they don't get offended or they don't, don't get, uh, uh, so that you are not disrespectful to them. So that means without any great purposes, <laughs> without any great purposes, you are just digging the earth kind of playing, you know, wasting your time, getting distracted, or picking at the grass, or drawing patterns on the ground, then by recalling the advice of the Buddha. Because Buddha, Buddha had advised that you should not waste your time engaging in meaningless activities. So recall that, and uh, develop some fear, and immediately stop doing those things. When you, when you for example, pick up, you know, the grass, pick at the grass or dig the earth, it is actually, in a way, disturbing other sentient beings who are there, right? Normally with the grass, there will be so many small insects, you know, you are disturbing them, you are frightening them. So that's the reason you are, you know, encouraged not to do it. Whenever I have the desire to move by my body or to do say something, first of all, I should examine my mind and then with, 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 state, with steadiness act, act in the proper way. That means whenever you want your body move from one place to another place, or you want to move your hand, or you want to say something, First, it is important to examine your mind, where you want to move, what you want to say, why you're moving your hand and things like that. So there should be this uh, stability of mind, okay? Verse 48, whenever there is attachment in my mind and whenever there is the desire to be angry, I should not do anything or say anything, but remain like a piece of wood. I think don't, you don't need any explanation, explanation to this. Next, whenever I, whenever I have distracted thoughts, the wish to verbally belittle others, feelings of self-importance or self-satisfaction, when I have the intention to describe the faults of others, pretension and the thought to deceive others, whenever I'm eager for praise or have the desire to blame others, whenever, whenever I have the wish to speak harshly and cause disputes, 
At all such times, I should remain like a piece of wood. Okay, that is also quite clear. Whenever I desire material gain, honor or fame, whenever I seek attendance or circles of friends, and when in my mind I wish to be served, at all these times I should remain like a piece of wood. So after this gathering here, you will become a piece of wood. <laughs> Floating on the surface of the river. <laughs> and whenever I have impatience, laziness, cowardice, shamelessness, or the desire to talk nonsense, if thoughts of partiality arise, at these times too, I should remain like a piece of wood. Mm. Having in this way examined their minds for disturbing conceptions and for thoughts that strive for meaningless things, the courageous, meaning bodhisattvas, should hold their minds steady through the application of remedial forces. So whenever negative thoughts come, you should be alert and cultivate the counter forces. Being very resolute and faithful, steady, respectful, polite, with a sense of shame, apprehensive and peaceful, I should strive to make others happy. That means, whenever you do a Dharma practice, you should know how to do the preparation how to engage in the actual practice, and how to conclude it successfully. successfully. So that means being very resolute means being, being very con confident about your practice, how to start. And in fact, it is because of this, tomorrow, you know, today we'll, we'll finish reading from the Bodhisattva Charitara. Tomorrow we'll read a sh very short text that talks about the whole path from the beginning to the end, how, to, how you should do your practice. So we are going to read this, right? So therefore, being very resolute. Resolute means you should know how you should start the practice, how you should carry the actual practice, and how you should conclude, so that there is no doubt, there is proper understanding and similarly, there should be faith. Faithful means there should be faith so that you know the meaning of the text, so there sh you, sh you have the faith. Steady means you, you made a strong uh, promise. And respectful means, respectful means that when you Engage in that practice, there should be joy in your mind, delight in your mind. Respectful and, and, and polite. And then polite means when you see your lama or your abbot, your teachers and others which are object of respect, object of offering, then you should be polite. And then also there should be sense of shame, as I explained earlier, putting yourself as a reason. You should stop doing many negative things, thinking that I am such and such, therefore I cannot do this. 
And apprehensive means you should also be fearful of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. If I engage in doing such things, then this is, I, I should be fearful of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then in a peaceful, peaceful means, then in a peaceful manner, peaceful manner means you should put restraint on the five senses. As we already discussed, if you don't restrain your senses, there will be development of negative emotions. So therefore your whole effort should be how to serve others, how to make others happy. I should strive to make others happy. That, that, is, your, that is your mission, that is your goal. I should not be disheartened by all the whims of the childish who are in discord with one another. I should know this to arise in their minds. I should know this to arise in their minds due to disturbing conceptions. and therefore be kind towards them. Meaning that we, when we live in the ordinary life, you, you please one, then the other will be unhappy. So it is because of this, there, should be, there, there is dis discord among people. So that, that is the nature of this childish people, ordinary individuals. <coughs> And all these ordinary individuals, they have this discord and it's very difficult to please them. Try as much as you can. It's, as, as we say in English, one who tries to please, everyone cannot please one, even one, right? So they have different needs, different purposes, you know, it's not easy. So it is because of this, if you are, for example, doing the bodhisattva practices, there will be somebody who will say, why are you wasting your time? There will be others who will say, wonderful, you are doing bodhisattva practice, wonderful. So therefore, when people praise you, don't get too happy. If people are saying bad things, don't get too discouraged. You are who you are, you know, their praises and their defamation will not change your state. So again, piece of wood, <laughs> like a piece of wood. I should not be disheartened. When people, people, if people say, if you say I'm practicing the Bodhicara avatar, reading Bodhicara avatar, and trying to cultivate Bodhisattva, you, you go and say this to people who have no idea about this, or who have some idea, who have no faith, they'll say, you're wasting your time, make money. Will this give you food to eat, clothes to wear? You know, that's their primary concern, you see. So of the childish who are in discord with one another, I should know this to arise in these minds due to disturbing conceptions. And you should know these things arise in their mind because of disturbing conceptions. The other day we, 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 we said, you know, you should, you know, make a distinction between the wrongdoing and the wrongdoer. The wrongdoer is doing this. The wrongdoer is bringing this discord because of presence of negative emotions. So that way they are helpless. So with this understanding, be kind towards them. Like small children making mistakes, you know, if small children make mistakes, the elders will forgive them, <laughs> you see? So it should be like that. In doing that which by nature is not unwholesome, both for the sake of myself and other sentient beings, I should always hold my mind fast, acting like an apparition with no sense of self. Right? So that means, when you engage in activities which is not so wholesome or un unwholesome, uh, nature, then nature, you engage in something that is not unwholesome. For example, if you listen to something which is wholesome, therefore not unwholesome. Huh? Or 
when you're eating your food, or you're listening to the Dharma, or you're giving a teaching, or you're practicing generosity, when you engage in all these things, I should always hold, hold my mind fast, acting like an apparition. Meaning that if you, whatever good and bad things you're doing, even when you do good things, there should be no grasping, no clinging, and see all these things as an apparition. Yourself as an apparition. Your, your act of giving is like an apparition. The person to whom you are giving is like an apparition. So purpose of seeing everything as an apparition or illusion is so that there is no grasping. Otherwise, you, you might boost up your arrogance, thinking that I am the one who was giving. Look at me, I am so kind. Right? So you get puffed up, you get inflated. So therefore, in order to have that, Dharma practice can also become a source of boosting your arrogance. So in order to stop that, you should see everything as an apparition. There should be no grasping of I and mine. By thinking again and again that after a long time I have won the great, greatest leisure, likewise I should hold my mind as utterly unshakable as the king of mountain. That means by thinking again and again, what should you think is, you should think that after a long, long time that I have now got this human life, precious human life, greatest leisure. Leisure means having the capacity of opportunity to do Dharma practice. So this being so, now I will make my life meaningful. Likewise, I should hold my mind as utterly unshakable as the mountain. So by meditating on this preciousness of human life, the leisure and endowments, you should, you should be happy and commit yourself to doing positive practice. And uh, your mind should be like a mountain that you're committed to such a practice. Because you know this is probably the last opportunity for me to do Dharma practice. It's not going to come again and again. If in mind you are not make if if my if mind you are not made unhappy when this body is dragged and tossed about by vultures greedy for flesh, then why are you so concerned about it now? So this is now talking about uh, the second kind of morality, which is called morality of collecting virtuous practices. Now in this case, one main reason why we are not able to remove attachment is we are not able to engage in practicing the precepts is because of your attachment to the body. Because you, you take so much care about your body, which is in a positive side important, because that body is the basis of your doing Dharma practice. But on the negative side, if you develop too much obsession and grasping to your body, that's a hindrance. Develop attachment, that is a hindrance. So in order to reduce that attachment to the body, he's saying, if mind, now he's telling the mind, mind, you are not made unhappy when this body is dragged and tossed about by vultures greedy for flesh, then why are you so concerned about it? Now that means when you die, when your body is disposed of, it will be eaten by wolves and vultures and tossed around and kicked around. Even if the head of the king, when it turns out to be a skeleton, people will kick, <laughs> kick at it. They'll never say this is the head of the president or prime minister <laughs> in the cemetery, you know, they're all same, right? So when at that time, when such a, such, you know, when it is treated in that way, you don't feel unhappy. So why, why are you so happy, unhappy right now when people say something about you? People, you know, well, so this being the case, why you are so obsessed with your body right now? And then, then he talks about the disadvantages of developing grasping to this body. Holding this body as mine, why mind do you guard it so? Since you and it are separate, what use can it be to you? 
So he's talking about the obsession that you have, or the mind that has this obsession to the body. Why are you protecting this body so much? You're giving food, you're giving clothing. You should stop giving food to the body. You should stop giving clothes to the body. If this body is not doing anything good, why, why you are taking care of it? It's like your, your housemaid or somebody who is supposed to be working, but he's not doing anything. Why you should give salary? Why you should give salary? Since you have fed and clothed this body for so long, the body should also do something. If that is not doing, then why you continue to feed it? And if you look at the actual nature of the mind and the body, the body is made of the regenerative, the egg and the ovum coming from the man, the male, the father and the mother. So it's really a material object. Mind is, as I said, is totally different, non-physical. So what is the use of this, this body to you? When, you? when you die, you go alone, the body will not come with you. So why are you so worried about it? Why are you taking care of it? Now, if you try to answer this by saying, yes, I know this, but to make the mind survive, I'm using this body as a support. If you answer in this way, then the next answer is, hmm. Why confused mind? Do you not hold onto a clean wooden form? Just what is the point of guarding this putrid, dirt filled mission? So he's saying, instead of owning this dirty, smelly body, you should better keep a wooden form, wooden, wooden body, <laughs> which may be cleaner, <laughs> things like that. So first of all, now, now you, should, you should by yourself see what is there in the body. This is not only in the Buddhist teaching, you know, you know this, this saying, beauty is skin deep, you know that? Beauty is skin deep, and the next line, I've asked this question to many people, they don't know the next line. Beauty is skin deep, ugly goes all the way down. That's the next line. This is said by somebody by the name of Dorothy something. Beauty is skin deep, ugly goes all the way down. Huh? Yeah, 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 I saw Dorothy something. Beauty is skin deep, ugly goes all the way down. This is what he's saying. Now see the ugly things that goes down. First of, first of all, mentally separate the layers of skin from the flesh. How many layers of skin are there? Seven layers. Dermis, epidermis, and so forth. And then with the scalpel of discrimination, separate the flesh from the skeletal frame. And having split open even the bones, look right down into the marrow. While examining this, ask yourself, where is its essence? The, the point of understanding this is not just to frighten you, but this, this is to help you understand the reality. Now, by understanding this reality, there, there, there are many benefits. The one benefit is, of course, you will be able to reduce your attachment and obsession to it. Second, by seeing the fragility, you know, the, the vulnerability of the body, you should be taking more good care of it. Because in terms of its nature itself, it is not so clean, you know, that's why we have to clean again and again, you know, so that way. But that doesn't mean you are bad or anything. But still that body is very useful for your practice, right? So therefore it is important to, to understand your body. So actually, you know, for, for, with this regard, you can actually make a nice movie out of it. There, 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 there are already a number of documentaries which really tells in and out of the body. 
you can you can you can use this for Buddhist teachings. I have been thinking about it, but I never got somebody who can help me with the, all these things. Somebody who is very good in making, taking out this. This they are already there. You need to say, simply take it out and make it available to everybody while explaining this. You see, now now we can take the benefit of scientific findings. I mean, go inside. Go inside and see the intestines, the lungs, the livers, how they are functioning, how fragile they are, you know. So once you know this, then you, you, you will have no courage to put everything in your mouth. Right now, because we don't know this, the external body looks good. It is, you know, plastered with skin, so it looks okay. Right? Right? Not knowing that the beauty is skin deep, you know. So therefore we think I can eat everything, drink everything, right? So it's very, very, very important, not only to reduce attachment, but also to take good care of your health. So if you look at the nature, this is the thing, there is no essence. If even when searching with such effort, you can apprehend no essence, then, then why with so much attachment are you still guarding this body now? This is not only body. We already discussed about the meaning of emptiness. If you look at the ultimate nature of all phenomena, it's not just body. When you search, you'll find nothing. It's only a name, a designation. And we are so much into that mere name and mere designation right get confused with it and develop such a strong grasping and craving where we get stuck right so are you still guarding this body now you should say yes why because i want to do dharma practice i still need this body i know it is fragile i know it has not much essence but it is i can use it or you can you can say, no, now I know, I will not guard it, in that sense. What use is this body to you if, if, it is, if, if it is dirty insides are unfit for you to eat, if its blood is not fit for drink, <laughs> and if its intestines are not fit to be sucked? At second best, it is only fit to be guarded in order to feed the vultures and jackals. That means you are getting it so that you are able to give it to the vultures and jackals in the future to feed them. I mean, you don't, you don't have to wait until you die to feed the jackals and things like that. The Buddhist practice is when we eat our own food, we also imagine that you are offering this food to the, what, what do you call it? Insects or bacteria, what do you call it? Inside. Huh? Good bacteria. Huh? Good. Guts. 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 Bacteria. Anyway, so you are feeding those 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 sentient beings. So in this way, you can you can eat and also make make you can also practice giving if you know the skill. Is <laughs> a double double benefit. <laughs> Truly, this body is a body of a human being should only be employed. So therefore, use it. That's what he's saying. Until now, he was disparaging the body because you're not using it. If you don't use it and give it, then what is use of taking care of this body? Yet, should you instead guard it with attachment, then what will you be able to do when it is stolen by the unsympathetic Lord of Death? Now you're taking so much care, but what will you do when you die? and given to the dogs and birds. Then he gives an example. If servants are not given clothing and so forth, when they are unable to be employed, when they don't do their job, then why do you exhaust yourself looking after the, fle the flesh alone? When even, when even though caring for the body, it goes elsewhere. So now having paid my body in wages, I shall engage it in making my life meaningful. So that is 
the reason that we are talking about. However, if my body is of no benefit, then I shall not give it anything. Starve yourself then. Don't eat anything. And especially those of us who have both the eyes intact, both the hands intact, both the legs intact, it's an amazing opportunity to do many things, many good things for others. There are people who want to do things, but they, are, they have no hand, no legs, no eyes. Many people like that. Well-meant people, you know. So you have all these great facilities. I should conceive of my body as a boat. Mere support for coming and going. That means going out of the samsara and going to the nirvana. If you want to cross an ocean, you need a boat. Similarly, in order to cross this ocean of samsara, you are using this to cultivate positive qualities so that gradually you can cross the ocean of samsara and achieve liberation. And in order to benefit all others, transform it into a wish-fulfilling body. That means the body, nature of the body itself is not very good, but if you cultivate all these good qualities, including bodhicitta, that, that we read right in the beginning, by holding bodhicitta, this filthy body is transformed into a precious, wishful fling body. Transform it into a wishful fling body. Now, while there is freedom to it, now when are you going to practice? Now. Now, while there is freedom to act, I should always present a smiling face and cease to frown and look angry. You should, you should look happy. <laughs> you should look happy. <laughs> right? You should look happy. You are born as a human being. You have freedom. So smile. And why, why, you, are, why you keep on frowning and look angry? I should be a friend and counsel of the world. I should des desist from inconsiderately and noisily moving around chairs and so forth, as well as from violently opening doors. I should always delight in humility. So that's easy to understand. These are few suggestions that you should be polite in your life. I should desist from inconsiderably and noisily moving around chairs and so forth. When you move chairs and furniture, there are people living around you, you know, you should, you should be considered and see whether, you know, you're disturbing them or not. As well as from violently opening doors, when you open the doors also, if there are people living inside, don't open it violently because they might be, they may be meditating, they may be studying, they might get frightened, you know, so open the door, you know, quietly. And when and, and, and somebody is coming, you open the door, let them come in first. These are common sense things. Thus, so, so you should, <laughs> for, for a while, you should forget your human nature and act like the stroke, the cat, and the thief. <laughs> Follow them, that's what he's saying. The stroke, the cat, and the, th and the thief, by moving silently and carefully, accomplish what they desire to do. A bodhisattva too should always behave in this way. That means when a cat is after mice, he will not just go around saying, meow, I'm coming. The cat, cat will never say it. He will go quietly, you know. And you, you've seen these lions, tigers, you know. When, when you see the tigers and lions, one thing you see is concentration, you know. The buffalo is there. Their eye, you know, mind is completely on that and then go slowly, quickly, you know. So we can, we can learn, learn from them. <laughs> With respect, I should great, gratefully accept unsought after words that are of benefit and that wisely advise and that wisely advise and admonish me. At all times, I should be the pupil of everyone. So this, this I think, I'm not so clear about this. There are different interpretations. One is saying, that you should give advice, good advice to everybody. I think that's the correct version. You should give good advice to other people. And if some other people are giving good advice to you, then don't say, who are you to teach me this? I know this already. You should really respectfully receive those advices. With respect, I should gracefully accept 
unsought after, even if you have not asked for such advice, but if some people gives you that advice of benefit, accept it gracefully. And that wisely advise and, and admonish me, that, that part, so I'm, I don't agree with that. So, so it is basically saying, you yourself should give advice to others, and if some others give advice to you, accept that gracefully. In other words, you should be people of everyone. Don't think you are a geshe, so you cannot learn anything from others. Right? You can learn good things even from the mouth of the child. Right? And if somebody gives you this unsought, you know, advice, you should say, well said. You should say, well said to all those who speak Dharma well. Okay? If somebody is sharing Dharma, you know, you encourage them. Don't say that, oh, how many, how many years you studied Dharma? First you study carefully, then you teach, you know, don't say things like that. They are, they are at least making effort. And if, if, if I see someone doing good, I should praise them and be well pleased. Now, if you are not very well pleased, it means you have no love and compassion to those people. Like, for example, if it is the duty of, a, duty of the parents to look after their children, that they do something good. And if they are doing something good, or if they find something important without your asking, the parents will be very happy. So similarly, when other sentient beings are doing something good without your asking, appreciate. It's good. My sentient beings are now doing very well. My brother, sister, sentient beings are doing very well. Wonderful. If you see somebody finished his PhD, don't think that, oh, she has done PhD. Who is she? Who is she? Don't think like that. My brother, sister, sentient being, did PhD. My brother, sister, sentient being, developed bodhicitta. Wonderful. You see? Wonderful. Rejoicing, as we studied earlier. I should discreetly talk about the good qualities of others and respect the, those that others recount. If my own good qualities are spoken about, I should just know and be aware that I have them. So that means it's important to speak, highlight the good things of others. But if you speak too much about the good things of others in front of that person, then it, if it looks flattery, then don't say it. Say it behind, discreetly. That means actually you are really, really supporting. I should discreetly talk about the good qualities, because if you talk about these things in front, sometimes it looks like, you know, flattery, okay? And repeat those that others recount. That means if others are saying good things, you are not saying it now. If others are saying good things, then you should also join them saying, wow, wonderful. Oh, he did this. He did this. Oh, wonderful. Normally we don't say that. Normally if somebody says good things about other people, then say, yeah, that may be good, but I know her ugly side, you know. I know his ugly side. Don't, don't do this. Because right now you're talking about the good things. When you talk about good things, say good things. Hopefully if you are dying to say, there will be other day when you will be able to say the bad things of that person. Okay, not now. If my own good qualities are spoken about, if somebody talks about my good quality, how good Geshe Lakdola is, huh, then you should not become arrogant. You should not become arrogant. Instead, you should think, oh, I did not realize, I also have some good qualities. <laughs> right? All deeds of others are the source of joy. See? That would be rare even if it could be brought with money. So this kind of joy is real joy, real happiness. You cannot buy it with money. Therefore, I, would be, I should be happy in finding this joy in the good things that are done by others. So, so happiness and joy actually is so easy to cultivate if you have that encompassing loving kindness and compassion. Right? Yeah. Through doing this, I shall suffer no losses in this life. You lose nothing. You are simply rejoicing. And in future lives, she'll find great happiness. But the fault of dispelling, disliking that, that their good qualities will make me unhappy and miserable in this life and in future lives. And in future lives, I shall find great suffering. 
When talking, I should speak from my heart on what, it, what is relevant, making the meaning clear and the speech pleasing. I should not speak out of desire or hatred, but in gentle tones and in moderation. Speech also. There are three types of speech. The best type of speech is it should be like honey, sweet. Second is like flower. Third is like a filth. So it should be like honey. Okay. When talking, I should speak from my heart on what is relevant, making the meaning clear and the speech pleasing. And, and the important thing is most of the time, if possible, we should not be fond of speaking. We should listen. There are many people who speak, very few people who listen. <laughs> you see? Nature has given us one mouth two ears. That means listen more, speak less. See more, listen more, speak less, one mouth only. But we are very fond of speaking, you know, just like me, I'm speaking, 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 <laughs> not listening to, to your questions. Huh? <laughs> but in gentle tones and in moderation. When beholding someone with my eyes, see, this is so beautiful. When beholding someone with my eyes, thinking I shall fully awaken through depending upon this being, I should look at that person with love and an open heart. Always being motivated by great aspiration or being motivated by the remedial forces. If I work in the fields of excellence, benefit and misery, great virtues will come about. And do it with wisdom and joy, I should undertake all that I intend to do. I need not depend upon anyone else in any actions that I undertake. So that means when it comes to doing Dharma practice, you should really be wholehearted that I will myself do it. Don't say that I'll, I will be able to do it if somebody helps me, no. It's not saying you can never take the help of others, but, but your, in terms of your dedication, you should say, I will do it. That's what he's saying. End of it with wisdom and joy. I should undertake all that I intend to do. I need not depend upon anyone else in any actions that I undertake. You know, there's this story of uh, Atisha, a very famous teacher, who always used to make this uh, mandal offerings. And in those days, maybe on slates, you know. So much, they do so much offerings that even, you know, blood comes out. So somebody, somebody said, shall I help you make the mandal offering? Then he was annoyed. He's saying, will you eat for me? When I'm hungry, when I'm hungry will you say, I'll eat for you? <laughs> so you're eating the food will not, you know, elevate my hunger. So you are done doing Dharma practice will not help me much. So let me do my practice, you see. So that's what he's saying here. The perfections such as generosity are progressively more exalted, but for little morality, I should not forsake a great gift. Principally, I should consider what will be of most benefit for others. Now, this is talking about the practice of the six perfections. So out of the six perfections, out of the six, or six perfections, the first ones are uh, the, 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 the last ones are more important than the first ones. Generosity, everybody can do, right? Morality, there are different types of morality, but it's more important to practice morality than just giving, you know? So, so they are, in terms of uh, uh, what word he uses, the perfections such as generosity are progress, progressively more exalted so that means morality is more, you know, exalted than generosity and so forth. But for a little morality, I should not forsake a great gift. But that does not mean that you do a small moral, moral practice and then abandon a great practice of great generosity. Principally, I should consider what will be of most benefit for others. 
When this is well understood, I should always strive for the welfare of others. The far-seeing merciful one has allowed a bodhisattva to do some actions that for others were forbidden. So that means when you are very sincere, very faithful, then depending upon the occasion, in certain occasions you can do those things which are forbidden in other occasions. So, so the Buddhist practice is not like this is the only way you can do this, right? This is the only way, right? So there, there are occasions when you can, when you can relax the, the law. I should divide my foot amongst those who have fallen to lower realms, those without birth. Now this is about your foot. I should divide my foot amongst those who have fallen to lower realms. Give a part of your foot to those who have fallen into lower realms, like animals and so forth. And also those without protection. And also practitioners, some of the practitioners, they just focus on their practice, have not, not much food or money give them, and eat merely, and then remaining you eat, eat merely what is sufficient for myself. Except for three robes, I may give away all. That, that is in connection with the, the, the monastics, the monks and nuns. The monks and nuns cannot, they can give everything, but they cannot give the three robes, because that is symbol of their ordination, right? This body which is being used for the sacred dharma should not be harmed for only slight benefit. By behaving in this way, the wisest of all beings will be quickly fulfilled. So it is important to work with the dedication, things like that. But this does not mean to say you should harm your body for, for, for little things, because this preserving your body is very important for achieving a greater purposes, right? Those who lack the pure intention of compassion should not give their body away. Instead, both in this and future lives, they should give it to the cause of fulfilling the great purpose. In the name of practicing compassion, if you sacrifice your body, that is a mistake. That is a mistake, you know. This, this reminds me the, uh, what they call it, there is a replace, believe it or not. These days I didn't see that documentary. Earlier there were so many. Replace, believe it or not. So there they show all these magics and tricks and then, then they, at the end they say, don't practice it in your home. <laughs> so this is something like that. So you talk about importance of compassion, helping everybody, then at the end it says, but be careful, you know, when you have not reached that state, you can't just give, up, give away your body like that. Okay, the Dharma should not be explained to those who lack respect, to those who, like the Sikh, were, wear cloth, uh, to those like the Sikh, uh, wear cloth around their heads, to those holding umbrellas. No, I think this is wrong translation. To those holding umbrellas, sticks, uh, sticks or weapons, to those with co covered head. So that means, you, when you listen to the Dharma, you need to be respectful. So you should not give Dharma teaching to those who lack respect. Sign of having no respect, it depends again from custom to custom, you know, you can't say this is custom applicable to everybody, you have to see. So ordinarily in the Indian tradition, you know, those who like the sick, no, no, this is completely wrong. The root text is those who are not who are not uh, not sick. If you are sick, exception. If you are sick, you can you can wear you know hat or whatever you know, cover yourself with cloth and things like that. Even when you are not sick. Then we are in cloth around your head and things like that. This, this is a sign of disrespect. So this is wrong translation. To those with covered heads, even when you are not sick, to those holding umbrellas, sticks or weapons. Again, His Holiness, when He gives teaching to a big crowd, naturally they may be, many of them may be sitting in the sun, then He would always say, cover your head. 
use your umbrella. <laughs> this looks like against this teaching, you see. But it's not against the teaching, generally speaking. If it is not necessary, then show respect. If it is your, for your health, then okay, you can cover yourself, protect yourself. Not to women unaccompanied by a man, the vast and profound should not be taught to lesser beings, although I should always pay equal respect to the Dharma of the lesser and higher beings. So that means, in terms of teaching also, teaching is very important, but if, you, if a monk gives a teaching to a woman alone in a house, not necessarily that they're, they're going to do anything bad. Not there's no certainty, but people might think something. You see, so therefore be careful. That's what he's saying. And the vast and profound should not be taught to lesser beings, people who don't appreciate Mahayana teaching, not ready to listen. Then don't teach it. If they are not able to understand it, don't teach it. But should always pay respect, equal respect to the teachings of the higher and lower beings. Mahayana or not, doesn't matter. It's all taught by the Buddha, so therefore you should respect all the teachings. When this is well understood, I should always strive for the welfare of others. The far-seeing mindful ones have allowed a Bodhisattva to do some action. Oh, no, no, not this one. What, what are we reading? Sorry. Verse 90, I should, verse 90, right? I should not communicate the Dharma of a lesser being to one who is vessel for the vast Dharma. I must not forsake the Bodhisattva's way of life, nor mislead others by means of sutras or mantras. So that means, if that person has a great intelligence and who, who is ready to receive the Mahayana teachings, give Mahayana teachings, not the lesser ones. So depending upon their need. No mislead others by means of sutras and tandras. If, if they are not ready to listen to the teachings of the sutra, and especially the mantras or tantras, then, then don't mislead them. Don't mislead them, especially the tantric teachings, you know. Tantric teachings. People may not be able to understand it, you know. When I spit or throw away the stick, for cleaning my teeth, I should cover it up with earth. You should not just spit and leave it open, you know. Also, it is shameful to urinate and so forth in water <laughs> or on land used by others. So these are all common sense, but we do, therefore, the suggestion is there. You know, you're always thinking about the well-being of others. If I do this, how people will react, right? How will it harm or help others? When eating, I should not fill my mouth. Eat noisily or with my mouth wide open. I should not sit with my legs outstretched, nor rub, rub my hands together. So that means when you're eating, you just, just put enough food in the mouth so that you can easily chew, you know. Some people, they are so hungry, they, they just completely fill the mouth. <laughs> not like that. Or eat noisily, not like that, or noisily, or with my, my mouth wide open. <laughs> I should not sit with my legs outstretched. Now these are, these are you know, when, when somebody is giving a teaching, if you have your legs outstretched, again, it may be your health or culture. I mean, I'm not going to do, make a big deal with that, but basically anything that is disrespectful like stretching your feet towards the teacher, towards the holy images, these are seen as not so good, right? And especially those of you who practice Buddhism, then respect the text is also. I've seen many times His Holiness is giving teaching, they all come to listen to the teaching, and the text, when they feel cold, they put it under them, like, like a question, you know? Even including His Holiness picture, I've seen many of them doing that. So this is, of course, depend upon your, your culture and things like that. But according to Tibetan or Indian culture, this is not nice. This is not good. You should respect. Okay. I should not sit with my legs outstretched, nor rub my hands together. This, this line, nor rub my hands together, not at all clear to me. I read four or five different commentaries. I compared, not at all. One says when you 
wash your hand, don't rub the hands together. It doesn't make sense to me. Of course you do like this, right? I tried to do this, only first wash this one. <laughs> then second, <laughs> still you are touching, you know, so it doesn't make sense. Yeah, then uh, I think there was another commentary which one says like rubbing hand means like, like this, I think, like this. This is a little bit show of arrogance, you know. So don't do like this, especially when somebody is teaching. I think that's the meaning. It's not so clear. <laughs> not rub my hands together. I should not sit alone in vehicle, upon beds, nor in the same room with the women of others. Because then the husband will come chasing you. In brief, <laughs> in brief, having observed or inquired about what is proper, I should not do anything that would... So this is the summary. This is the summary. Having observed or inquired about what is proper, I should not do anything that would be disliked by the people of the world. So do not do anything by which people will lose their faith. People will develop suspicion. Anything, whatever you do, make sure that this is unnecessarily disturbing other people's, you know. So don't say, let people think, you know, this is my life, this is my body. Don't say like this. <laughs> like some people said this during the COVID-19, you know. They, 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 are, they are not ready to take the vaccination. This is my body. I don't want to take a vaccination, you know. Then later on, they got, they got, got the COVID, it got very sick, so they are coming to take the vaccination, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I should not give directions with one finger, but instead indicate the way respectfully with my right arm, with all my fingers fully outstretched. So that means, if, if somebody asks you, did you see somebody going this their direction? Or if you want to say, okay, go this way, then don't say, go this way, not like this, with the head. Go this way, that way, slightly more polite. So, so whatever is polite, okay? Nor should I widely wave my arms about, but should make my point with slight gestures and a snap of my finger, otherwise I shall lose control. Nor should I wildly wave my arms about means if, if for example, in a, in a group of gathering of the monks, if you want to say something, then, then why don't you do this? What are you doing there? Not like this. <laughs> no, that's what he's saying. Nor should I wildly wave my arms about like this. But should, but should make my point with a slight gesture. Much gentler, you know. With slight gestures and a snap of my fingers, otherwise I shall lose control. Just as the Buddhas lay down to pass away, so should I lie in the desired direction when going to sleep. And first of all, with alertness, make the firm decision to quickly rise again. So now when you tonight or when you go to bed, you should sleep in the posture that the Buddha observed when he was passing away. That means Buddha slept on the right side, right side, right side, not on the left side, not like this. Unfortunately, I am fond of sleeping like this. <laughs> then also not face down. I think that scientifically there's some reason. And what I found was actually you, your sleep will be a little bit light and there's better possibilities of getting up quickly. Okay, there's the purpose. And then of course, if you sleep on this side, your heart is here, you know, giving a lot of pressure to the heart and things like that. And you have difficulty breathing also. So sleeping on the right side is very good in that sense. Okay. And some people sleep face down. I don't know how they breathe. <laughs> when I sleep face down, then I make sure I put the pillow here, so at least there is space for breathing. <laughs> Just as the Buddha lay down uh, to pass away, so should I lie in the de desired direction when going to sleep. And first of all, with, with vigilance, and make that motivation, make the firm decision to quickly rise again. I'm going to get up at five. It's your real alarm clock. And it really, you're really able to get up. 
if you set that motivation. If you don't set any motivation, then, then you will sleep like a dog. Although I'm unable to practice all the limitless varieties of bodhisattva's conduct, true, it is not possible to practice all, especially in the beginning, I should certainly practice as much as has been mentioned here of this conduct that trains the mind. Three times by day and three times by night, I should recite the Sutra of the Three Hips. Three Hips basically means uh, there, there, are, there are three separate texts. <clears throat> so three hips means confession uh, rejoicing and dedication but there are also three 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 texts on it so so we all end up committing negative deeds if that happens then the best way to purify it is three times by day three times by night I should recite the Sutra of the Three Hips. One is called Tungshak, confessing the downfalls. And then uh, also, uh, and that, that confession is done in re with respect to 35 Buddhas. Okay? Like that. Whatever I am doing in any situation, whether for myself or for the benefit of others, I should strive to put into practice whatever has been taught for that situation. There is no such thing as something that is not learned by a bodhisattva. Thus, if I am skilled in living in this way, nothing will be non meritorious The purpose of bodhisattvas is to benefit others. In order to benefit others, the bodhisattvas should be knowledgeable. Right? So therefore he's saying, there is no such thing as something that is not learned by bodhisattvas. They study all the subjects. So that they are able to study medicine, they study you know, monastic discipline, and so forth, to benefit others. Thus, if I am skilled in living in this way, nothing will be non meritorious That means now you have the capacity and the knowledge to teach everybody. You can teach medicine, you can teach philosophy, you can teach Buddhism, you can teach ethics, you can teach resilience, you know, so many things you can teach. Whether directly or indirectly, I should not do anything that is not for the benefit of others. So that is the point. Solely for the sake of sentient beings, I should dedicate everything towards Bodhicitta or Buddhahood. Never, never, even at the cost of my life, should I forsake a spiritual friend who is wise in, in the meaning of great vehicle and who is a great bodhisattva practitioner. So this, this, such practitioners are your most reliable friends, so you will never forsake them. I should practice entrusting myself to my spiritual master in the manner taught in the biography of Sri Sambhava. This and other advice spoken by the Buddhas, I can understand through reading the sutras. So by reading the sutras, you should know how you should relate to your spiritual teacher. Now, this is again very important point. You know, in today's world, it is not that easy to find a reliable spiritual teacher, right? So, right in the beginning, don't come to yourself saying that I am the student of, or in other words, I am the, my, such and such person is my root guru. Don't, don't jump blindly. Don't jump quickly like a dog seeing a piece of meat, right? Take time. You can listen to that person, listen to the lectures. If you get benefit, of course, it's good to say thank you. It was very beneficial, you know. 
Even if somebody gives you a cup of tea, you say thank you. So that's, that's no problem. The problem is if you start tying your neck with others, saying that this is my teacher, you know, he is everything for me. Sometimes I do feel that we have this tendency of, you know, connecting to others in a negative way. When you say this is my teacher, you, you almost show as if you are married to that person. You see, it's not like that, right? It's not like that. <laughs> Right? So it takes a take little bit more time. So that's why I always say, for the time being, if you have no spiritual teacher, then mentally imagine His Holiness Dalai Lama as your teacher. The, spirit, the spiritual, it is not necessary that the spiritual teacher is always with you. If possible, good, but not, not necessary, especially in today's world, today's time. You know, you can listen all those teachings online. So, so don't commit yourself to somebody without testing. And after do testing, if you find that person reliable, reliable in, in many ways. Normally, a teacher should have many qualifications, but three qualifications are very important. First, the teacher should have compassion. That's the most important quality. If he has a genuine compassion, then he will help you. Second, he should have he or he, she should have more knowledge than you, otherwise he can't teach. <laughs> Third, he should be ready to undergo some hardship, spend some time, give some time to you to teach. So at least these three things should be there, right? So, so read more, you know, and then if there is a need to find a teacher, then take time and don't rush, don't rush. I should read the sutras because it is from them that the practices appear. To begin with, I should look at the sutra of Akash Garba. I don't know if this is available in English or not. And similarly, the biography of Sri Sambhava, you know. In addition, I should definitely read the compendium of practices. I think this is available in English. There's one translation of the whole text, very, very big book like almost like this book and uh, that translation unfortunately to my view is not a very good translation there's only one translation i think and uh, the root text is the root text is only three four pages which i've translated some some years back so if you're interested i can email you that and i should and in addition, I should read, I should definitely read the compendium of all practices, which is called Shiksha Samujya, again and again, because what is to be constantly practiced is very well and extensively shown there. So that text primarily teaches about how to, you know, give, give away your body, your resources, and your virtuous practices, which we actually read a little bit earlier. Also, I should sometimes look at the condensed compendium of all sutras, also by Shantideva, and I should make my effort to study the words, works by the same two titles composed by the exalted Nagarjuna. I should do whatever is not forbidden in those works, and when I see a practice there, I should impeccably put it into action in order to guard the minds of worldly people. The defining characteristics of guarding alertness in brief. Now this is the summary of what, what do we mean by vigilance or guarding alertness. In brief is only this, to examine again and again the condition of my body and my mind. That is called vigilance. Where am I going? What am I doing? What am I thinking? Again and again, Watching that, that is called guarding alertness or vigilance. Therefore, I shall put this way of life into actual practice for what can be achieved by merely talking about it. So now stop talking, stop, start practicing. That is what he's saying. Finally, <laughs> finally he says, stop talking, start practicing. For what can be achieved by merely talking about it? Will the sick receive benefit? 
merely by reading the medical text or by reading the menu, as I said earlier. Okay, so we are done with the first five chapters of Shantideva's Bodhisattva way of life. So now if you have one or two questions, you're welcome. Otherwise we'll disperse. But we have one more session tomorrow morning. Uh, nowadays, many people are talking about uh, manifesting, uh, manifestation of things. Mm. Uh, I would like to know the uh, the opinion of Buddhism for this, because to me, from your teachings, it doesn't really come together. So, yeah, manifestation possibilities are there, of course. But uh, again, again, investigate, use your vigilance, mindfulness. Don't simply run after people saying that he's a manifestation. Manifestation means reincarnation, right? Reincarnation. Now in the Tibetan society, unfortunately or fortunately, there are so many reincarnations. Not only Tibetans, but you know, there are many people who just when they hear that such and such person is reincarnation, they just 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 them, follow them. So many, many reincarnations. So what you what you want if you aspire will manifest. That's what you're saying. What what you want if you aspire and work for it, it will manifest. Are you saying something like that? Hmm. Not necessary. Depends. Many things depend on many thing, things. There there are the things that you work and then it manifests, meaning that you will be able to achieve it. Right? There are things which will take time, you know. So, so it is not, there is no certainty that whatever you do, you will be able to see the fruit at least immediately, quickly. There are things whose fruit you can see manifest in a short time. Then there are others, like for example, if you want to get the, get the Buddhahood <laughs> or achieve Nirvana, <laughs> As I said, it's almost impossible. I'm not saying impossible, but almost impossible. Given our die-hard habit, given the situation and surroundings, given our distractions, it's almost impossible. But it is okay to have these desires or this... Yes, it's wish, not only wishes. okay, it's important. It's important, right? Because if you are, for example, flying to America, it's like 17, 18 hours flight. Now, if you say this is too far, too long, I will not even move from here, you will ne never be there. But if you say, yeah, it is very far, but I will slowly move, and first I'll just go to Delhi. Then after that, I'll just go to Europe and take rest there. Then. Then, then America is only eight hours away. Mm -hmm. You know, then you can go there also. Like that, step by step, step by step, yes. Uh, in the morning you had mentioned about the wave particle duality. Mm which kind of challenges the basis of classical physics. Yes. Uh, in that case, you know, there are a lot of parallelisms like that from quantum physics yes. and Buddhist philosophies. Yes. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts when you come across such findings or such 
uh, discoveries in science? Does it? No, do you no, think it's? No. You know, some of those findings which which are in harmony with the Buddhist teaching, then it is a great confirmation of what we have all been talking about. And basically, I'm not now praising Buddhism, okay? I'm not saying this is the best religion. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm also not saying I have a lot of knowledge about science and philosophy, things like that. But but I read a little bit here. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a jack of all trade, you know? So so I read, I read a little bit here and there. I, I am fond of reading, you know? I, 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 I read small pieces from many, many leading philosophers, Western philosophers, scientists is also. Scientists means that the science means my reading of science is layman's science, not with mathematics and things like that. <laughs> Luckily, there are so many books for laymen, you know. So, so most of my readings are supporting the Buddhist teaching in a different language, with different examples. It's so useful to me. You're saying the same thing, but in a different language, in a different cultural context, but really talking about the same thing, right? So that, that is, for me, very, very comforting. But then I can explain it. Look, this is not only Buddhism, this is what this philosopher has found. This is what this scientist has found. Of course, still you can do experiment, but uh, and then then the good thing, maybe maybe a little bit blind faith. I don't know, but at least what I know is, for example, all these you know discoveries or findings that you see in the Buddhist teaching, is found through inner reflection, deep deep inner reflection. And hopefully, I, mean, I think not hopefully, it should be. In many cases, these findings are based on, you know, extra perceptions, clairvoyance, or maybe omniscience also. Because if you read the Buddhist text, there is one level where we can all say, yeah, that makes sense. I'm reading Buddhism for the first time, but it makes sense even to my common you know sense and common knowledge so you are able to agree with that then you go to a next level where they talk about spiritual levels 10 spiritual levels five spiritual grounds and the, the unique you know qualities that, that you achieve when you reach each of these five you know grounds and uh, 10 spiritual levels in detail it has explained if you reach the first level, this will be the characteristics. Second level, this is the characteristics. Now, how can we confirm or deny that? Impossible, even through scientific. Science, of course, is not focusing much on mind, so there's no way you can talk about this. But there's such a detailed explanation. So what I'm trying to say is, if somebody has not gone through all these spiritual levels, if somebody has not experienced all this, I mean, it's, what they've written is really like a very detailed guide map to travel to the state of enlightenment. The many levels of concentrations, you know, things like that. It's really amazing. It's really amazing. So those, those levels, I don't think science will talk about, and science is able to talk about it, even next, you know, probably one century or one decade. This is so far advanced. Right, but but I'm talking about those levels, like like you know, your experience of emotions, you know, different levels of emotions. Why this kind of emotions are bad? Why this kind of emotions are good? You know, these are all proved through scientific findings, all you know, supported by philosophers, thinkers, like like the teachings of Aristotle or Plato and Socrates. The summary is very similar to the Buddhist teaching. If you, if you read this, Plato's cave. It's, he's very much talking about the conventional truth and ultimate truth. Of course, with a different example, you know. So like that, yeah. And Tashi Dilek, uh, 
if the soul you sir yeah 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 sir if the soul is empty of existence or illusory uh, then who is the doer or the decision maker the we in buddhism we don't believe soul then who is the doer or the decision maker the person the, the ego the i the i not the ego i the person and where, who is this i just designation <laughs> and how how do things function just by designation that is mystery if we think a little bit deeper our our mind will be shattered because we are fond of just you know tightly holding on something concrete you know if i say this is nothing just by bubble you will be shocked if, especially if, if i say your body is nothing just by bubble you will be shocked to teach you but when you really scientifically go down it is a bubble as has been that is what i am saying you know this is clearly mentioned in the buddhist teachings and shin buddha himself taught about this that, that physical form is like a bubble feeling is like a form whatever you know he give this five examples how did he find it he had no instrument to measure those things at that time now they are saying scientists now saying with big mic powerful microscopes they are see, they are seeing this exactly that right so it's really amazing so if you want to fathom into that amazing reality then <laughs> we need to do a lot of meditation a lot of practice <laughs> i'm curious what soul does mean in buddhism huh? what soul does mean in buddhism soul soul we don't yeah. believe in soul yes but how you define soul because we don't believe there's nothing to explain but <laughs> out of buddhist like do you have a concept no no the reason we, we refute soul is i mean it's basically how you use the term but normally when we talk about soul you're talking about something that is permanent okay especially in the ancient indian tradition soul atma is something permanent uh, partless independent so buddhists are refuting this by saying that there is no soul which is permanent partless everlasting mm -hmm. no then the question arises that question you ask then what is it that goes to the next life it is the mind it is the person and i i had already given you the example of mind originating from snow, snow mountain and going down to to the ocean you know it is the continuity that goes so there's no need to have something permanent to go to the next life it is the continuity that goes just like you you have come from the, your childhood up to this level like like that yeah okay uh, it's a philosophical question here yeah. how does buddhism define the deep sleep state because western science says it's an absence of consciousness whereas the eastern says the consciousness of absence so how does uh, buddhism take it the deep sleep state deep sleep state also we have consciousness not only we have consciousness but we have very subtle consciousness because because the, the reason that we say there is consciousness because you are not dead you are still alive you still have feeling so there is consciousness yeah. so is it only consciousness in deep state or something more than that energy is also there all the elements are still functioning you are not dead fire element is there wind element is there water element is there so all the elements are there still what else you want <laughs> because that's that's what happens in the waking state because waking state the gross body is still up the five elements are working yeah, yeah, in the yeah, deep but, state but, but the... deep, deep still sleep state they are in a more dormant state but still they are functioning okay so as per buddhist philosophy the all the elements are still working but they are in a more uh, less functional state absolutely. but the consciousness dominates in the deep sleep state absolutely yeah thank you thank you yeah last question to read already Oops. yes yes i already <laughs> i already yes, I'll give you. Okay. Okay, okay, thank you. told them to 
prepare the copies. Yes, you will get. Yes. Thank you. It's fine. <laughs> Good practical question. Yeah. <laughs> Enough? Thank you. Hmm? What is Buddhist point of view of abortion? Abortion actually is not good. Think before you act. You know, most of the problem arises, as we have been discussing, you know, think, where are you going? What are you doing? So when this doesn't happen, then we end up making a child, and the only next thing is abortion, you see? So abortion, I don't know the details, but abortion might mean killing. Because according to Buddhism, mia mirchawa, that means, you know, you die, go into the intermediate state. That intermediate state is now looking for a place, a room to rent. Then he sees the, the future father and mother mating. And because of karmic force, he sees this as, if there is a karmic connection, he this, sees this as a beautiful garden or place, something like that. The consciousness goes there and gets stuck there with that union of the egg and the opium, get stuck there. So now already consciousness is there, even in the womb, right? So, so, so already the formation of human being is taking place, consciousness is there. So abortion, I think, I don't know details, but from this viewpoint, it is like this, yeah. All right, thank you. Dedicate all the good things to benefit everybody. <laughs> <laughs>